come to our eighth and last phase of our learning, which is science. And the learning civilization having eight phases. When we come to science in the way in which we are approaching it, we are given an advantage which very few people have ever had. We come to science in a visionary, conscious way rather than in a ritual comportment that is simply integral by the symbolic mind. It is very difficult to appreciate. It is easier with art for us to appreciate that art is an expansive, expressive, differential form and not at all a condensed, integral form. A work of art opens out more and more. The more one is acquainted with it, the more one is refined. The shareability of the appreciation of works of art can go on not just for years or centuries or millennia, but indefinitely. We can appreciate the pyramids of Egypt that are 4,500 years old and constantly add to the differential expressiveness of their forms. The Gathas of Zarathustra are 4,000 years old and we can read them today with uh, an expansion in translations of the Avestic into English or Farsi or some other language. Even more so, the forms of science are differential and they are expansive. Their expansive differentiality is a harmonic of the resonances of art forms. So that the forms of art and science are forms that are differential and expansion that goes on into, literally, into infinity. Whereas integral forms are always limited, they are always finite, they always will have a structure which is a condensation of the dynamic from which they came into the energy that is compacted into their form. Now to begin science, to begin our phase of science, I'm taking the two most famous scientific figures of the 20th century who were epical. I'm taking Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr. And we're taking them because they come to one of the most fundamental transformations that has ever happened on this planet. Einstein comes from the very large, he comes from the cosmology of the whole universe, whereas Bohr comes from the very minute subatomic, the particles, the subatomic particles. So we come from the infinitesimally small and the infinitely large, and yet Einstein was enough of a genius to give a form to the infinitely large cosmos so that the whole sense of cosmology was revolutionized, and even today. And the book that we're taking is Kip Thorne's Black Holes and Time Warps, Einstein's Outrageous Legacy. Uh, Kip Thorne is at Caltech. He's been there for a number of years. He's been doing gravity wave research. He began under John A. Wheeler, and he is like uh, Richard Feynman or some of the other great Caltech uh, professors. He's just a marvelous uh, figure. And this came out uh, a couple of years ago, and we're pairing with it a book on Niels Bohr called Niels Bohr's Times, uh, by Abraham Pius, uh, who was a physicist in his own right and uh, who knew all of the figures uh, personally. And so these two 
uh, books, one a biography and the other an appreciative illumination of Einstein, Bohr and Einstein give us together a confluence that will allow us to begin our phase of science. When we get into the second phase of science, uh, the second step, we'll take another pair of books and I'm going to use a biography of Barbara McClintock, uh, A Feeling for the Organism. Uh, this biography of Barbara Mc McClintock is extremely important and what is given here is the gender difficulty of science at the beginning of the 20th century and the absolute need for gender uh, parity and freedom at the beginning of the 21st century. And one of the great chapters, the beginning chapter in here, that characterizes Barbara McClintock, and we'll see the, the capacity to be alone, that one of her successful text was that she was able to work for half a century, literally almost alone. And we'll see that when she does her genetic work, she does it with a kind of corn. We call it colloquially Indian corn that you see at Thanksgiving time or Halloween time in the markets. It's a kind of maize. It's a native American Indian maize. And she found that genes will jump around in the chromosome on their own and that these transposons are essential in the way in which the variety of life is assured in integral forms and yet at the very same time has a complementarity in the differential possibilities that allow for art and science to occur in a different mode from natural integration. And then uh, paired with it, we'll take uh, Nancy Kress, one of science fiction's brightest uh, authors. So I'm taking two women, one who deals with the science fiction aspect of genetics and one who did the primary primordial work on genetics, showing us that life has a differential dimension to it inherently. And what we're appreciating in our learning, in our education, is that while life is natural, consciousness is differentially uh, supranatural. In one view, you will have a universe, a one place, which is completely natural, that includes everything up to and including our brains. At the very same time, interspersed and interfolded with that is a completely different ecology of dimensions that will fit into the natural dimensions. And while nature will have four dimensions of space and time, Consciousness has four dimensions of differentiality. And so we're learning that there's at least an eight-dimensional basis for reality as far as we are concerned when we get to science, when we get to an analytic, not of the universe, but of the cosmos. And we will have then not a universality so much as a cosmology which complements a universality. And then we will end with uh, three of the most uh, incredible figures of the uh, 20th century, Richard Feynman and a pair, Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking, to take us into some of the motions of 20, late 20th century science that produced a revolution. Uh, Feynman, uh, I, we're going to take his book QED, which stands for Quantum Electrodynamics, which began in 1905 when two of the world's greatest mathematicians got together and decided to offer a joint course at a mathematical 
school in Germany called Göttingen. And the two great mathematicians that were there at the time, one's name was David Hilbert and the other's name was Hermann Minkowski. And what is interesting is that these two great world-class mathematicians <coughs> grew up in the very same city, Königsberg, across the Prestel River that runs through Kroningsberg, and they lived within blocks of each other. And later on, when they became world-class mathematicians, they lived within two blocks of each other at the University of Göttingen. And it's this peculiar tuning that made it possible for something extraordinary to happen, especially vis-a-vis -vis Albert Einstein. When Albert Einstein was uh, born, he was born in Ulm, Germany, but his parents, by the time he was just one year old, moved to Munich. And he was going to uh, the schools there. His father's business was not doing very well. And um, so the family moved themselves about 14 years later to Milan, Milano in Italy whereas the young Einstein wanted to stay and finish his uh, schooling in uh, Munich. Then he went to join his parents in Milan, but he was not very comfortable or happy there. And so he got a chance to take an um, entrance exam to the Zurich Polytechnic, later on uh, known by the initials ETH a very, very famous school in Zurich, Switzerland. He passed the math and science and physics tests easily, but he was still immature and so couldn't pass the other parts of the exam and had to wait a year. And after that year, finally he was let in and his instructor in math <coughs> at the Zurich Polytechnic was the young uh, genius Hermann um, uh, Minkowski. Later on, dying early of a disease, I think Minkowski was 44 years old, Einstein remembered his original teacher and remembered the close relationship that Minkowski had with David Hilbert. And so when he was ready, to finally publish his epical making general theory of relativity. He went to the University of Göttingen and stayed for six weeks near David Hilbert to honor both Hilbert and Minkowski. And that series of six lectures was the basis of uh, his book on the theory of general relativity that completely changed science for all time. And it is Einstein's outrageous legacy, mainly of the general theory of relativity that is extremely important for us and for our learning. The specific theory of general relativity is about the localized conditions that resemble a Newtonian universe. Whereas when you bring in a dimension to time-space. In a Newtonian universe, time-space is a flat quality, but as soon as you bring in strong gravity or vast, enormous distances, time-space itself, space-time, begins to curve. And its ability to curve is un encumbered, so that time-space under enormous gravitational or distance conditions will curve such that it will curve in upon itself. And just as some projectile that goes out of the Earth and goes around the Earth fast enough so that it will go into orbit, space-time itself will curl into a self-consistent orbit and will become a black hole. And it is Einstein 
in the summer of 1915, staying near the wonderful David Hilbert, remembering both of them, their friend Herman Minkowski, who was the first one to put space and time together and make it a four-dimensional continuum. In that summer of 1915, we have to remember that Europe was embroiled in the First World War. The war between Germany and the Allies, France and England, and eventually the United States. And so in the midst of this first great titanic war, which shredded a hundred years of European history, from 1814 to 1914, in that hundred years, European history had been quieted down by a consensus that was reached at a uh, political council called the Congress of Vienna. And that was called by all the nations in Europe, including the United States, after Napoleon almost set up another empire. They wanted to forestall this kind of world war empire building permanently. And so the Congress of Vienna portioned out certain things. And one of the things that was portioned out was the ability of any particular Europe, European power to gain hegemony. But in the meantime, in that hundred years, the European power that gained hegemony was Britain. And the British Empire spread over the whole world. And by 1914, there was a movement in Europe, especially in Germany, to gain parity with the British Empire by making an empire again out of Europe. And so the First World War was this shredding. And the fact that just as it was shredding the political geography of most of the earth, because all of the European powers had colonies all over the world, and so it was a world war. What also had happened in that hundred years is that the confidence in physical reality had slowly dissolved. And the confidence that one could pound existential things in 1814 and that you were doing something real, by 1914, the certainty of the physicality of the universe had faded away into phantom qualities of mystery. One of the things that happened early on was that a little short man named Michael Faraday, who used to sweep out the laboratory of Sir Humphrey Davies, Davies allowed little Michael Faraday to do some experiments, and lo and behold, Michael Faraday was a greater genius at physics than Sir Humphrey Davies. And Faraday is the one who discovered that magnetism and electricity were intimately related and went together and were the force that makes the universe work, electromagnetism. And following on Faraday had come a Scottish recluse genius named Maxwell, James Clark Maxwell, and by the late 1870s had fashioned out two volumes of the theory of electromagnetic and in those two volumes put a mathematical form upon it. It was in that year, 1879, that Einstein was born. And so one notices the peculiarities in science that it is a blossoming emergence of a very special kind that has paradoxical coincidences that when they align, one sees not just that they're paradoxes and coincidences, 
but they are resonances that form a set whose harmonic has a mysterious dynamic always. While the form of the cosmos can be known differentially and the form of the universe can be known integrally, the dynamic that comes out of the universe being known integrally is visionary consciousness, which has an infinite range of possibility. And we'll see what comes out of the scientific form of the cosmos is uh, the mysterious dynamis, which is nature herself. And so when we come back from science, we emerge into the next phase, which was our first phase, which is nature. And that nature is not a form at all, is an energy that is in its dynamic and is purely dynamic. And part of the pure dynamis in nature is that the first dimension, time, instantly, almost instantly, blossoms into space. And space creates form. But the creation of existential forms out of the mysterious dynamic of nature is almost infinitesimally weighted towards form integrally occurring. The uh, mathematics at the uh, end of the 20th century was refined enough to show exactly what the um, uh, chances are. Matter and antimatter are created equally into form out of the mysterious dynamics of nature, except that matter is given a slight, very, very slight, almost infinitesimal weight to its probability of occurring. The probability is one in 300 million parts. And so there will be, out of 300 million particles, subatomic particles, atomic particles made in the universe, the particles that are anti-matter and the particles of matter will completely negate each other and you will have again pure energy, a pure dynamis, but one part in 300 million will register and stay in existence as matter. And out of that infinitesimal amount, the entire visible universe has been built over 14 billion years. Now this is extraordinary because the math that was found was progressively developed in the 19th century, right up into the beginnings of the 20th century. And the figures who founded that were all heroes of Napoleon. Lagrange, uh, and especially Fourier, when Napoleon took his uh, big expedition to conquer Egypt, he not only took all of his legions with him, but he took a whole legion of French savants, scientists of all kinds, and th they were going to do a complete scientific survey of the origins of civilization, the first great empire, the Egyptian. And the man who put this together, the publishing of 20 great volumes, Napoleon's great publishing effort, uh, the description of Egypt for all time, I will bring in next week uh, one of the original illustrations, engravings of it. It's uh, three feet by two feet, 20 volumes. The man who oversaw this was the great mathematician Fourier, Joseph Fourier. And Fourier developed and was given a decoration by Napoleon that was a huge uh, military uh, exploding star with ribbons and everything. He developed what are called the Fourier transforms, a way of seeing what transformation is when you arrange it in a series. That the transform that comes after 
the previous transform will have to take into consideration what that transform had done and what is carrying over. And so one had for the first time the ability to follow mathematically not just the structure of forms but of the movement of processes as well. And what came out of this was not the limitation that relations between things are also things, they're relation things, this belonged to the Cartesian universe, but that the movement of relationality itself was of a different nature and was a dynamic and not at all an energy structure. And so what comes out of that is the ability to appreciate something which Newton had brought in originally. And that is, you have to have a special kind of differential transform mathematic to be able to characterize the reality of the universe. And his Principia Mathematica uh, uh, in 1687 set the stage for all of this, and then Fourier, a uh, hundred years later or so, made it a mathematical possibility, and during that whole century, both math matured and the physical science of experimenters like Faraday and Maxwell matured together. And so by the beginning of the 20th century, you had a pair of cognate developments in science. One is based on the laboratory and experiment the other is based on theory and mathematics. Einstein is the greatest theorist and mathematician of the 20th century. Bohr, and not just himself, but all of those that he trained became the most influential experimental scientists of the 20th century. And here is a difference between the two men as well. There is a confluence of mathematical figures into Einstein. There is a development out of Bohr into a lot of other associates and students of his who became as famous or even sometimes more famous than he. And so you have this hourglass effect where the mathematical tradition comes to a point in Einstein and Bohr opens his point up into the development of experimental science. Out of Einstein comes the tradition of using an advanced conscious expansion to be able to characterize the cosmos, whereas Bohr's science is that one has to make models and experiments and keep track of them, and it is only through the ability to keep broadening the specific base by strategic experiments that one can uh, develop scientific form. So in a way, they crisscross each other, and they crisscross about the same time, right in the middle of the First World War, because at the time, uh, Einstein was born in 1879. Bohr was six years younger, 1885. Bohr's mentor was a man named Sir Ernest Rutherford, originally uh, from New Zealand. Um, when uh, Rutherford was born, uh, New Zealand had only been successfully colonized for about 30 years. It had been known since the days of Captain Cook, but as someone pointed out, um, the Maori natives of New Zealand were occasionally very forthcoming and wonderful to be around, and then they would have these cannibal feasts, and they were kind of ferocious to be around because they liked barbecue Europeans. And it wasn't until some intrepid Scots came to New Zealand with an idea of not making it an economic or military colony, but to develop uh, farms and to also make educational 
places where even the Maoris could come and get educated. And someone pointed out that the American West was covered with saloons, but uh, New Zealand was covered with little schools. And Sir Ernest Rutherford was born about 30 years after this uh, became possible. And when he went to school to England, the place that uh, accepted him initially was Manchester. Manchester, England, Manchester University. And as soon as he got ready to become a professor, he was looking for some place in England, but the job that came up was thousands of miles away in Canada at McGill University in Montreal. And so Sir Ernest, before he was Sir Rutherford, went to McGill and began setting up his little experiments, and part of his experiments were to experiment with uh, very odd materials, uranium, thorium, and radium, three radioactive elements. And he got a supply of these because he knew uh, Madame Curie in uh, Paris. She and her husband were some of the first people and Marie Curie is really like the taproot of understanding uh, radioactivity. And so quickly did he thrive that he wrote the very first textbook published by Cambridge University called Radioactivity. He was able to write the first printing of it in February of 1904. And within months, he had to put out a second edition, enlarged greatly, three extra chapters. And he says in here that this is an unheard of explosion. He says the three new chapters which have been added possibly constitute the most important changes in the work. These chapters include a detailed account of the theory of successive changes of its application to the analysis of the series of transformations which occur in radium, thorium, and actinium. The disintegration theory of radioactive phenomena. And it took them a long time to figure out what was happening. And Rutherford, with another young experimenter at McGill, Friedrich uh, Sadi, found that what they were detecting here was something very peculiar. The, for example, the sample of radium that was being used, courtesy of Marie Curie, shipped from Paris to Montreal, that when Saudi was measuring its radiation, whenever Rutherford would come into the room, it would change. And they began to wonder if he had some kind of Maori shamanistic magic about him. What is going on here? Why, why would the readings change just because Rutherford came in the room? Then they've discovered, because they were scientists, that what changed was not Rutherford coming into the room, but that he opened the door to the lab and the air moved ever so slightly and that something in the air was changing the radioactivity. So they managed to um, isolate in some glass tubing the air in the lab after the radioactivity mater uh, radioactive material was loosened. And in this tube, they saw that whatever was ghost-like in this tube would lose its radioactivity and that in a period of about 11 and a half hours it would lose half of its radioactivity. But that as it did so, the radioactivity that had uh, uh, lessened before in the original sample reinstated itself and curved back up and reactivated itself full strength. So you had two different curves. You had one curve that was going down, the other curve that was going up, and they happened 
at, at the same time. Later on, when they understood what this was, and he was knighted as Sir uh, Ernest Rutherford, he put this double uh, curve on the family crest on the shield for uh, his knighthood. They discovered that what was happening is that the radioactivity, by this time they were using not radium but thorium, the radioactivity was shifting from thorium to an unknown. And so they called the unknown thorium X. And of course the abbreviation for thorium is TH. And so literally the beginnings of radioactivity research is like the monogram for George Lucas's THX, which is his first great film of um, the domination of human life by a abstract pseudoscience society tyranny. It's interesting because one begins to see that there are paradoxes that align themselves and you begin to see that by the early 21st century we have arrived at a torrential threshold that dwarfs all previous revolutions. And the only way to style this that I have found is to use a new word, a new R word. We're not dealing with a revolution, we're dealing with a recalibration of everything, including ourselves. This learning civilization cycle that we're going through is the recalibration that is essential, is necessary, and will allow itself to be refined infinitely by those who employ it and use it. There's no limit to what can be refined out of this because this is not just an integral schooling nor is it even an advanced differential uh, analytic and uh, critical appreciation but that together they make a third kind of a complementarity and the title for this uh, first science uh, presentation is Bohr's complementarity and that's where this comes from and Einstein's relativity because they go together in a not just a massive way but an in interpenetrative way that the infinitesimally small and the infinitesimal large come together in such a way as to produce a mysterious dynamic which is real to such an extent that existence is a boiled down crystal of it. <laughs> that existential forms of matter, the kind of matter that we see making up the universe, are the crystal forms that have come out of a supersaturated uh, medium. And so nature, rather than being things, is a supersaturated dynamic and it is supersaturated because it has more dimensions of consciousness than space-time has places to put it. This is why our future lies in developing more dimensions of the cosmos that include our capacities than space-time had place to put them. It isn't just that we're going to become magicians. We're going to become magical artists who are great cosmic scientists who can play in nature and bring forms of existence into being that could never have been imagined before. One of the founders of this entire movement, David Hilbert. One of his great books, still in print, is called Geometry and the Imagination. And out of Geometry and the Imagination, he transformed an earlier classic, uh, which was Foundations of Geometry, also still in print. These books are never going to go out of style. This was the basis of Russell and Whitehead's great Principia Mathematica, which was a rewriting in 1901 of Newton's Principia Mathematica.
showing that logic and math are two sides of the same process. But it is in geometry and the imagination that one finds Hilbert opening up a quality of reality that has since always been known as Hilbert space. And we'll, after the break, come back and see how Einstein and Bohr were such complementary geniuses. They teased out of these beginnings the development of atomic energy, the development of quantum mechanics, the theory of relativity, and all of the science that now dominates the planet. Let's take a break. One of the most uh, powerful realizations that comes out of our learning is that the failure of civilizations before were based on a flaw. And the flaw came as a logical conclusion of the integral mind. Its conclusion was that human life needs to be organized by political forms that are grounded in an economic referentiality and that allied to the use of military force to maintain it or to expand it or to protect it. It's appropriate to have sirens of crisis at a moment like this. That dependence of a political economy it tied to a military is a flaw of civilization carried over from culture. When you have tribal cultures, the tribe is not organized by politics so much, but is organized, as we have seen in our myth phase, there's an anthropological predisposition to have a tribal leader, to have an adjunct of that tribal leader be the shaman or the witch doctor, to have a tribal structure where the ritual year follows the natural year, and so by enfolding nature into the ritual cycle and by enfolding the experience that comes out into the symbolic integral, tribal-based culture is able to even prorate itself so that you can have numbers of tribes brought together to make a nation. And that one can even try to stretch that to bring nations together than to have an empire. All the way through the assumption is that the integral forms of ritual and symbol, if they are uh, allied in an alignment, will then absorb and encase an alignment with nature and experience as well, experience being culture so that nature and culture will automatically be taken care of if you have a correlation of symbols and rituals so that the symbols will have a ritual existential referent and that logic is keeping these lines of identification linked together. On the tribal level, it works. On the level of kingdoms, it works. On the level of nations, it begins to become problematical. On the level of empires, it becomes tyrannical and a self-defeating flaw because civilization belongs to the dynamic of history, not to the dynamic of myths.
And in fact, vision already initiates a different cycle. Visionary consciousness brings with it a different ecology. And the first form to come out of the visionary consciousness are the forms of art, the forms of the person, the forms of a spirit. So that the organizing is not done on the basis of integration, but the structure is a differential structure. Politics is always an integral structure of the mind. It's always a symbolic structure. And it gets its confirmation, its referentiality, its correlation with ritual action. Um, the classic way to talk about it is karma. So that when thought integrates, Karma really is, one has a logical connection, this is how things are. This is the way they work. All of that is transformable as soon as consciousness comes into play, because consciousness is not a content of the mind. It is a dimension equal to space and time. So that visionary consciousness is a five-dimensional field, and its five-dimensional field makes a six-dimensional form. Works of art, persons, spirits are six-dimensional forms. They have a kaleidoscopic, not just multifaceted, but they have a faceted array that is able to be expanded indefinitely. And the expansion, the dynamic that comes out of the expansion of art forms, of person forms, of spirit forms, is that historical consciousness, which is a higher order, a higher calibration of visionary consciousness. So that history as a dyna dynamic is a seven-dimensional flow. Now the forms that come out of that will be an eight-dimensional scientific form, but science can only emerge from the dynamic of historical consciousness. Otherwise it doesn't emerge. Visionary consciousness has both remembering as a process and it has creative imagining as a process. And surely works of art come out of that so that the quality of formation, of structure that comes out of consciousness is aesthetic form rather than political form. And so the political form that comes out of the mythological horizon of experience has to go through several transforms to even approach being on a dynamic level where science could come forth and come out of it. And because consciousness has its ecology, its ecology can best be characterized as an aesthetic ecology. So that civilizations are stable, they have a gyroscopically stable, balanced, symmetrical chirality when they have an aesthetic ecology and not a political economy as the basis of, of, of structure for matured human life. Matured human beings cannot fit into nor stay in political economy forms. They constantly color outside those lines. Consciousness itself colors outside those lines vision. And it becomes even more uh, accentuated when you come to science because science now is the natural ally of an aesthetic ecology. So instead of a political economy tied to the military, you have an aesthetic ecology 
tied resonantly to science. And so science is a very deep antithesis to political forms. Science is a deep antitheticality to military force. And so when you come to the creme de la creme of science, even a hundred years ago, you find right away that figures like Einstein and Bohr are not only able to look through the ragged, tattered junkyard of the flaws of civilization, but to characterize it with unerring accuracy. And one of my favorite photographs, this is from Einstein, a portrait. This is Einstein standing in front of his bookshelves, and you see there are no books. There are hundreds and thousands of papers, all arranged in nice little neat stacks, arrayed with little identifying things. And the quotation that goes with this photo, force always attracts men of low morality. And I believe it to be an invariable rule that tyrants of genius are succeeded by scoundrels. So if someone is successful through the genius of manipulation of military power and political acumen and economic um, clout to set up an empire that works for them, well, they're there. The inheritors of that devolve, just like radioactive decay, very quickly. And the successful tyrant leaves a warring faction of scoundrels that become less and less uh, interested in anything except um, preemptive survival. Get them before they even think of getting you. And so you get the guillotine. You get the preemptive guillotine. Let's kill anybody that has any capacity to challenge us at any time, and especially let us deaden all of the features and faculties of learning, of vision, of art, of historical consciousness, including science, because these are all dimensions that jeopardize our ability to maintain our authority and control. And so you see, starting in the 1980s, a huge jump in the confidence that one can begin to limit, to crimp, to compromise the energies of art and science. And in the 1990s, as confidence built, as the political, economic, military, it isn't an industrial military complex that was characterized in the 1960s, it's rather a political economy that counts on a tie to force, to the military, the paramilitary, that focuses first on making sure that visionaries are called pie in the sky, impractical people. Then the artists are attacked as producing damaging kinds of works of art that make people uncomfortable and open things up. And we have to have a little bit of decency control, a little bit of authority, a little bit of uh, making sure that the styles are followed in the way that they should. And then comes the huge crunch because historical consciousness can only be co-opted by regressing it back into a myth basis. But the final war is against science. <laughs> Empires will always try to impair by ridicule the visionaries, to intimidate by jailing or by non-economic acknowledgement the artists. 
and they will always try to convince people that the historical things are just versions of somebody's private mythology. But they cannot challenge science in these kinds of ways. And so a war condition develops between tyrannies and science. Here's some quotations from Einstein to the point. The old power structure of failed civilizations was always based on a flawed connection between a political economy and its military. The flaw was reliance on such an order in the first place. And then Einstein, who was extremely uh, adept at making uh, phrases, said this, politics is a pendulum whose swings between anarchy and tyranny are fueled by perennially rejuvenated illusions. So that there is a cyclic periodicity of illusions that decay, and the decaying of illusions not only deepens the illusions, but it shifts at a certain horizon into another form because illusions are a part of the process of seeing, of experiencing, but a form comes out of them called delusion. Illusions are believing in the appearances, but a delusion is having the belief solidified in a mental idea, a mental doctrine in the mind. The mind puts it into a form of a delusion, whereas the experience was in the dynamic of illusion. Maya may deceive by dancing in myth, but Kali kills because she is a real form of delusion. Another Einstein uh, quote, all of us who are concerned for peace and the triumph of reason and justice must be keenly aware how small an influence reason and honest goodwill exert upon events in the political field. And again, it may affront the military-minded person to suggest a regime that does not maintain any military service. And finally, is there not a certain satisfaction in the fact that natural limits are set to the life of the individual so that at its conclusion it may appear as a work of art? One of the very deep qualities that came out in the middle of the 20th century in the intensity of science where it came together with Einstein and Bohr in an interpenetration that produced atomic energy, the atomic bomb, and the figure, the maestro who choreographed all of that happening was Robert Oppenheimer. And Oppenheimer was challenged directly by the political economy military in the House Un-American Activities hearings headed by Senator Joseph McCarthy. Robert Oppenheimer was chosen to be the sacrificial goat of science because he embodied an interpenetration of Einstein's relativity and Niels Bohr's quantum mechanics and the whole issue of atomic energy was brought to a head by both Einstein and Bohr as early as 1939. In fact, in order to impress the most powerful political, economic, military figure in the world at that time, who was not Adolf Hitler, who was not Winston Churchill, it wasn't Nazi Germany yet, it wasn't the British Empire, 
the most powerful figure in the world at that time was Franklin D. Roosevelt, the President of the United States, because the United States was very busy emerging not only out of the Great Depression, but in a virulent form of government and economy and military might that within a couple of years uh, became the dominant power on the planet, which it is still today. When one looks at the scale of the United States prowess in terms of the planet in 1939, and you realize just five years later, by 1944, it was the most potent economic, political, military power in the world already. Here in Los Angeles, by including women in the workforce, in the airplane factories, Los Angeles is a urban metropolitan area was outproducing all of uh, Germany just by itself. We were turning out more planes than they could shoot down, more tanks than they could shoot down. And then in the very next year with the atomic bomb, the United States leapfrog a million times beyond what it had been the year before. At that time, it was uh, Bohr and Einstein who had initially alerted Roosevelt in 1939 by concerted letter. It took over six weeks for the letter finally to get to Roosevelt's attention. It didn't get there until October, even though it had been sent to him in August of 1939. And the reason it got to him in October is that in September of 1939, World War II broke out officially. The Nazis invaded Poland, and it was obvious to everyone that this time Nazi Germany had the armaments, had the political will, had the economic uh, oomph, and had the military force to take over Europe. It was apparent then that this letter from signed by Einstein and Bohr should get to Roosevelt, that what was at stake here was a potential leapfrogging of such enormous power on the basis of science that no political form, no economic structure, no military that had ever been experienced by mankind before was going to be able to contain it. Because its power was not just the best, it was like a million times better than anything that had been there before. Bohr's whole emphasis was on the basis of his practicality. What Bohr's practicality amounted to is that he had formed very, very early on in uh, Copenhagen uh, by the time that Einstein was visiting uh, David uh, uh, <clears throat> Hilbert in Göttingen and was doing his six lectures to bring out the theory of general relativity, which would be published the next year, 1916. At the very same time, Bohr was laying the basis for a new kind of education, a new kind of a place, and he called it uh, the Institute for Theoretic, uh, Theoretical Physics. Everyone after, for a long time, called it Bohr's Institute. And at the Institute, he began bringing people from all different kinds of nationalities, from all over the planet to come and not just work together, but to transform together. And some of the brightest uh, people on the planet left where they were and came to Copenhagen and became known as the group as the Copenhagen School, the Institute for Theoretical Physics. It's still there, still there in Copenhagen. And you began to have people who were the brightest people on the planet coming together in such a way that they could talk with each other freely without any political, without any economic, without any military confines between them. 
And so they talk together on the basis of artistic persons filled with visionary consciousness, sharing a historical conscious dynamic, and so their science uh, grew exponentially. And one found within a couple of years, a handful of years, from the founding of the Institute of Theoretical Physics, that a completely new understanding of matter, a completely new understanding of energy, a completely new understanding of what man was, what civilization was, what reality was, emerged. And it was Bohr not as the leader so much. He was very frequently called Papa Bohr. He was like a father. He had sons of his own. But anyone that came to work with him, he encouraged them to do their work and not just to follow him. And so like a good father, he made a community that was able then by uh, resonances to go out and for, because each of them had been treated like a son, they treated their uh, students or their co-workers like their sons. And so he began to get the sense of the ripples of a family of man, that the cooperation was not based on political economy allied with military power at all, but was an aesthetic ecology of community allied with science in the midst of all of this as if it were like an energy working in synergy with it but from a different scale. Einstein developed the math that had come in 100 years from Fourier to where he was able to present a workability of a completely new way of um, assessing what was real and that the assessment was no longer on the basis of what was called Euclidean space. No longer the familiar three dimensions of space and as a matter of fact all political economies, all militaries are based on Euclidean space. If you draw a line that line will be there. So if we draw a line and we say you must follow that line, you will follow that line. But a great huge visionary transform had come into place. And the first place it came up was in art. And the first person it came up in was the French painter Cézanne. And Cézanne began to see in a completely new way he was able to see with kaleidoscopic consciousness so that in his space, in Cezanne's compositional space, it was no longer a Euclidean space, but it was a space that had jewel-like facets. So when he began to paint again and again a view that he loved, a view of Mont Saint-Victor, the mountain, as it was in Euclidean space, began to transform into the jewel of Cezanne's seeding, a quality that a Spanish pirate artist named Picasso suddenly, with his genius, leapt in and said, Cubism. We're not seeing Euclidean, but we're seeing in a new kind of a space, and this is a space which is a Minkowski space. <laughs> and at the very same time that Einstein was publishing his special theory of relativity, Picasso and Brock were making the beginnings of cubism, the Demoiselles de Envignon. And people say, well, this is ugly. Well, no, it's not ugly because it's not aesthetic in Euclidean space. It's aesthetic in kaleidoscopic Minkowski space where space-time are a continuum, and in that continuum, as Einstein had showed in the specific theory of relativity, that when space-time as a fabric extends itself out of locality to where distance or gravity comes into play, that space-time curves. Not only does space curve, time curves. As well. And not only does 
time curve, then, the dimension of time is no longer just time as an integral identification of a thing, but it becomes time-like. Space is no longer space in three dimensions, but becomes space-like. And then the genius of Einstein came into play far beyond even Minkowski or Hilbert, one of the greatest insights of all time. If in a time-space fabric that is so vast that it is the entire universe, and that that entire universe contains curvatures that are infinite, there has to be in that relativity then of that curvature of space-time, there has to be some constant by which one can, independent of a Euclidean position in that space-time, that one can have a basis upon which to do measurement, to do comparisons, to do compositions of scientific forms, of art forms. And he found that in between time-like and space-like, when they were brought together in a four-dimensional transform, Minkowski space transform, Einstein transformed that so that the, not the medium between time-like and space-like, but by the interpenetration of the two together as a single continuum, you came up with light-like. That light, photons, photons were not discovered as the carrier of light until 1923, years after Einstein saw it theoretically, not just in his visionary consciousness, but in his historical consciousness, because he understood the mathematicians that went before him and right up to him. And one of the grandest of those mathematicians was also one of the world's great early physicist. He was a Dutchman named Lorenz. And Hendrik uh, uh, Antun uh, Lorenz, usually H.A. Lorenz. And Lorenz had seen, with great genius, that there are series of transforms that can be done, and in those transforms there is a kind of a contraction into differential form, and instead of the integral of Euclidean space geometry, there's a contraction into what can and was called differential geometry. And the contraction that Lorenz came up with was due to an insight from an Irish mathematician named Fitzgerald, and so it was known for a long time as the fitzgerald lorenz contractions that you get a differential geometry form that is universally real and not just locally existential. It is more real than things. And out of this insight, Einstein found that the forms of the universe now become cosmic, light-like, so that the light is no longer just a photon vector in a transform of Euclidean space to a Minkowski space, but is now a light cone that occurs in an Einsteinian space. But that that Einsteinian space has to have a new kind of a geometry. One can't even use not only Euclid and the normal beginning non-Euclidean, but you had to have a different kind of a geometry altogether. And he found it in a mathematician, physicist named uh, Riemann. And it was Riemann's uh, spherical geometry that gave Einstein uh, the final clue. And the general theory of relativity is about a million times what the specific theory of general relativity is, all in the space of uh, about 10 years. All due to Einstein's ability to raise his visionary consciousness through his artistic person. When Einstein would immerse himself 
in his visionary consciousness, about the only thing that really appealed to him was playing his violin, which he learned to play as a little boy. And he would play Bach. And he would play Bach it, with such an intensity that the art form of the Bach music piece would allow him that prism, that art prism, to bring his visionary consciousness through into his great theoretical historical consciousness amplitude, and out of that came the scientific forms of the general theory of relativity and of many other things. In one year, he published in 1905, it was called his Miracle Year, the uh, Annalen uh, Mirabalis. He published five separate papers in physics journals, three of which are the three greatest of all time up until that point. One was on the specific theory of relativity. One was on Brownian movement. That if you mix certain liquids together, they seethe. Because the molecules, the atoms of the liquids, are being driven around randomly by the collisions randomly of the electrons of the atoms. And the third was on the photoelectric effect for which he received in a few years the Nobel Prize in physics. Not for relativity, but for the photoelectric effect, and we'll talk more about that next week. What Einstein was doing on his end and Bohr on his end came to a thrust where it emerged during the First World War, on both ends, both men suddenly became the centers of this uh, enormous leap in capacity for science to outstrip military power completely. And so the race was not on by the military to outdo. It cannot outdo science. But what it can do is through its political forms through its economic structure, the corporations and the political parties, is they can filter and cut down the effectiveness of the whole ecology of consciousness so that science doesn't occur really, only a version of science which is ritualistic. So that history doesn't occur, just a mythological cycle that parades itself as uh, history. So that art doesn't really occur, only some kind of pot pourri or potpourri of um, popularity, fashion, just nice designs. So that consciousness does not occur, not vision, but just projections. And all of this came to a head, as we were saying at the beginning of this second part, with the development of the atomic bomb with Robert Oppenheimer and being challenged in the McCarthy hearings. And he was taken away from ever having any further contact with science in a practical way. His clearance was revoked not because he was found guilty of anything, but because he was found suspicious of many things, and who knew if he were guilty or not. And so Oppenheimer did what <coughs> Niels Bohr had done. He went to the place, the Institute for Theoretical Consciousness at Princeton, which had been set up and founded to host Einstein when he left Europe for good. The Nazis were going to kill him. Einstein was not only Jewish. His science was powerful enough, and he was a world-famous figure. He could have almost single-handedly uh, taken uh, power away from the Nazis in Germany. Uh, there is a biography of him that has a cover of a magazine published in Germany already 20 years before, and it said, a new giant in human history, Albert Einstein. 
So by the time that he went to Princeton at the Institute of Advanced Studies, where Oppenheimer retired to and headed for the rest of his natural life, very much in keeping with Bohr's Copenhagen Institute of Theoretical Physics, these places like oases of a new civilization continue to be there, but shrunk and jeopardized so that by the beginning of the 21st century, it is obvious what the strategy is. To choke off any challenge to existing authority. More next week.